Hello. This will be the fourth lecture in our course in social inequality. Um, I'll be talking here about how the inequalities of social class that we've examined to this point uh, intersect with the inequalities of race and gender. So I'm going to go to the screen share and pull up our PowerPoint. Um, the starting point for today's lecture kind of goes back to what I talked about at the end of lecture number two um, about an intersectional approach or um, in that lecture, I referenced what's known as the matrix of domination, um, which was developed by uh, Patricia Hill Collins in her book, Black Feminist Theory. Um, basically, the idea of the matrix of domination and an intersectional approach is basically the same. Um, it's how these forms of oppression based on race, class, gender, uh, disability, age, sexual orientation, uh, all these variables that you see uh, here in the graph on the left side, how these are all part of an interconnected system and how they have to be un understood as operating together within people's lives. And so um, they're in that sense kind of inseparable and we need to take an intersectional kind of approach. So the theoretical perspectives that I'm gonna be drawing on for this video lecture, um, we're gonna be just kind of focusing only on, on race and gender. And we're gonna be uh, drawing from two texts that are in your, um, your larger collection uh, the textbook called The Social Construction of Inequality and Difference. And uh, we're going to be looking at um, Omi and Winant's text called Formation, Racial Formations in the United States and Judith Lorber's text on the social construction of gender. And these, these will provide us basically with like the theoretical building blocks, like the, the theoretical foundation for taking this intersectional approach to social inequality. And so we're gonna under, try to understand these uh, intersecting inequalities of gender, race, and class as they pertain to the things that we've talked about in the first three lectures uh, with regard to wealth, uh, poverty, um, you know, income and job opportunities and uh, privilege and power. So we're gonna take this kind of intersectional approach as we go on um, with respect to, to, at least with respect to race and gender. That'll be the main focus here. So um, racial formations in the United States is uh, been a, this, this highly influential study uh, that looks at uh, race and racism in the United States in you know, recent history, basically, um, from the 1960s to the 1990s, as the uh, you know the subtitle of the book describes it, and it has these three you know key parts. Um, first, the first part they look at race as a social concept and and kind of lay out their definition of what they mean by race. Uh, in the second part, they look at racial ideology and and racial identity, and then finally. Um, they take a historical approach in looking at what they call racialization and the historical development of race. And their argument, Omi, Omi and Wanat's argument, is, is basically suggests that race is a, is a fluid thing um, where the, quote, the racial order is, is organized and enforced by the continuity and reciprocity between micro level and macro level of social relations. So they're trying to understand how race operates at a micro and macro level, and then how that micro and macro level are connected. Um, and what they mean by the micro level of uh, social relations refers to the ways in which we understand ourselves and interact with others, the structuring of our practical activity in work and family, 
as citizens and as thinkers. So in other words, the micro level refers to the person's uh, individual experience and their everyday commonplace interactions with other people that they have, you know, in face to face or, you know, maybe in, you know, through mediated technologies, but it, the micro level basically refers to like the sort of like commonplace everyday activities um, among individuals within the context of like social interaction. Whereas the macro level of social relations refers to like the larger social structures and the dominant ideologies in a given society. So the relevant social structures include institutions like business, the media, and the government. Um, the dominant ideologies include cultural and stereotypical beliefs about race, class, gender, and sexuality. So these are sort of like the larger institutional structures, uh, organizational structures of the society in the economy, in politics, in the media, um, and also the dominant set of beliefs and narratives and stereotypes that we all inherit um, about you know, race, class, gender, sexuality, and their interconnections. So for Omi and Juan, when I want to understand how these two things are connected, how the micro and the macro uh, like interact and intersect in people's lives. And uh, we'll see when we look at Judith Lorber on gender that she also wants to understand the interaction between the micro and the macro. So these things kind of compose uh, a larger system of social relationships. And for Omi and Wanat, they want to emphasize the way in which race is a social construction. Um, the last slide referred to race as being something fluid in the sense that it is not fixed. Uh, it is not fixed in nature or in biology, but rather is something that is contested and something that changes over time, changes throughout history. Uh, our racial categories, our understandings of race, the meanings that we attach to race, all of these things are fluid, socially constructed, um, as they say in this uh, quote from this slide, unstable and decentered, right? So that they're subject to resistance. They're subject to change. They are not simply fixed in nature as something that will be, you know, eternally the same forever. Um, we have enough history that has accumulated um, uh, about race to know that our categorizations and our classifications and our understandings of race have certainly changed over time. So they argue that race is an unstable and decentered complex of social meanings constantly being transformed by political struggle. That in other words, it is not a natural category. Race is not a natural category, but a social and political category. Because of this, people can constantly contest the definition of race, both at the micro level and in the macro level. So in the, in the micro level of our like, it, you know, daily lives and, you know, the sort of like micro interactions or micro aggressions that we might face. And then at the macro level of the institutions of politics and and government and business and the, the larger structures of the, the, the society. So Omi and Wenant in their historical uh, analysis present race as something that is a relatively recent phenomenon within world history. Um, they describe how race uh, becomes established in social consciousness even without anyone having an explicit intention to perpetuate it. They say uh, everybody learns some combination, some version 
of the rules of racial classification and of their own racial identity, often without obvious teaching or conscious inculcation. Race becomes common sense, a way of comprehending, explaining, and acting in the world. So that part about common sense uh, is, is really important here. Um, or the uh, earlier part of that quote, you know, being saying uh, without obvious teaching or conscious inculcation. What this is referring to is, is that although race is a social construction, we are socialized into it in a way where it comes to seem as if it's natural. To, whereas if it seems like it's common sense, uh, where it seems like something that we don't have to think about, uh, that we take for granted, uh, that we, you know, kind of don't question in the same way that like, you know, a fish doesn't question the water that it swims in. Um, all of this says that race operates in this way where it is not natural um, but it comes to be like a kind of second nature, something that we are socialized into um, and we kind of absorb in this unconscious or semi-conscious kind of way uh, where, you know, there isn't like a kind of obvious teaching or a conscious inculcation, and yet it continues to uh, shape the way that we understand and act in the world. So the key takeaway here is, is that racial categories may appear to be natural or rooted in biology, but they are in fact socially constructed and subject to historical change. And one great example of this is from the book that's referenced here on the left, called How the Irish Became White, uh, written by a historian named Noel uh, Ignatiev. I, I hope I pronounced his name correctly. Mm -hmm. um, but in this book, How the Irish Became White, it looks at you know, the Irish as this group that, you know, in the 19th century, um, around the you know, era of the potato famine and the mass migration of, of Irish people um, to the United States, that the Irish were basically seen um, by the English as like a separate and inferior race. Um, if you go back and look at like 19th century cartoons of the Irish, they're often drawn to, you know, look like gorillas or they have all these kind of stereotypical, um, you know, stereotypes. They're, they're kind of like attached to their culture about like, you know, they're always fighting and they're always drinking and, yeah, you know, there was a lot of ways in which like the the racial stereotyping of the Irish became a kind of template for racially stereotyping other groups, right? And this was all, you know, the way in which like the English had kind of legitimated and justified their colonization of Ireland was to depict the Irish people as this like this kind of lesser uh, race as people that were cl closer to animals, um, you know, who were, who were like savage. Um, but in coming to the United States, uh, there's this process basically that the author describes in which the Irish come to be seen as white um, in the same, you know, way of all these other European ethnic groups and immigrant groups. Um, and partly a, a big part of how the Irish became white, how they came to be seen as white uh, in America in a way that they were not in Britain, um, was that they came to, you know, in a large part to join the forces of white supremacy in the United States. Um, they joined the Democratic Party in huge numbers. The Democratic Party at that time was was really the party of slavery and, and white supremacy in the 19th century. Um, and then, you know, also a lot of Irish people joined the police force, uh, became police officers, or in other 
you know, in, in all kinds of other ways, were kind of enlisted in the racial order of the United States um, as forces of, um, uh, you know, on the on the side of the oppressor, as opposed to being on the side of the oppressed and the colonized, as they had been in Ireland. Um, so this is a just a, a again a, a really fascinating example to think about how our racial classifications and categorizations um, they may seem to be like common sense uh, or natural, but they are in fact things that have changed over time um, and are historically variable. Um, another example to think about this is the way in which like mixed race people are categorized in different societies. Um, in the United States, going back to like the Jim Crow era, uh, it was instituted, you know, what's known as like the, the one drop rule. It's basically like, you know, if you had any kind of, um, uh, you know, the background uh, ancestry, of people from another race, um, then, you know, you, it, like if, if, if you had any black so-called blood in your uh, ancestry, then you were considered black. Um, and there was no kind of like in between mixed race kind of category. Uh, you were either black or you were white in, you know, like in the Jim Crow South. And if you had any black ancestry, you were black. Um, but that's not the way that other cultures um, that also have, you know, sort of like racially segregated systems. That's not necessarily how like Brazil or South Africa uh, um, would categorize people. Uh, in those societies, um, there were, you know, sort of differences, uh, distinctions that were made between mixed race, uh, you know, various mixed race groups. Um, and so a lot of times mixed race people would um, be, you know, would live in, in other specific neighborhoods or go to, you know, other kind of specific schools. They were not considered to be black or white, but to, you know, this, this sort of third thing. Um, so this is another example, again, of, about how these categories, um, although they may seem natural, they may seem rooted in biology, they are in fact socially constructed and um, subject to historical change and uh, subject to like political contestation uh, to resistance. So for Omi and Winant, a racial formation perspective is, is needed to explain race as quote, an autonomous field of social conflict, political organizations and cultural and ideological meaning. This is what they call a racial formation perspective. And they define racial formation as the process by which social and economic and political forces determine the content and importance of racial categories and by which they are in turn shaped by racial meanings. So this racial formation perspective basically emphasizes the extent to which race is a social and political construction that operates in this intersection between the micro and the macro, uh, between the individual identity and the social structure, and to understand how those things are, you know, separate but always connected with one another, always in interaction, the micro and the macro, always interacting with one another. And those two levels interact to form, as they say, a racial social movement when individuals at the micro level are mobilized in response to political racial injustice at the macro level. So, you know, the classic examples being like the civil rights movement, where the uh, injustices of the Jim Crow South, the, you know, racial segregation, mobilized people, you know, commonplace, ordinary, you know, otherwise powerless and oppressed peoples to organize, to demonstrate, to sit in, to commit acts of civil disobedience, uh, 
um, to risk their lives, you know, to go to jail, um, all these things that people did uh, in joining that, you know, racial social movement, uh, this movement for for social justice. Um, more, you know, currently in our times, we have uh, Black Lives Matter that has been mobilizing uh, in response to, you know, police killings of Black people um, and, you know, other kinds of, you know, forms of vigilante violence, like uh, George Zimmerman's murder of Trayvon Mer uh, Martin. Um, so those kind of macro level injustices have been motivating for people at the sort of micro level. And it, you know, changes people's lives. It changes the way people, you know, kind of think of themselves and their understanding of their um, place in the society. We have plenty of other examples like this. The, the American Indian movement uh, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, the Chicano movement uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, there has been, you know, next week we're going to talk about like the farm workers uh, movement in the United States and, and, you know, particularly here in California. So there's no shortage of examples that we can point to, uh, both historically and in the present, of how people have mobilized at the micro level to contest these larger social injustices at the macro level. So um, the sort of complementary article uh, also in the social construction of inequality and difference uh, that looks at how race and class kind of intersect with regard to the question of, of wealth um, is this uh, article called The Asset Value of Whiteness, uh, done, you know, it was a study basically conducted by um, a little a team of, of sociologists. And basically this, this team of sociologists concluded that uh, race, the racial wealth gap, um, in, and they looked at, uh, you know, sort of data from white, black, and Latino households to basically study this question of, of wealth. And if you'll remember going back to the first lecture, we talked about how um, for the vast majority of people, people who are not super wealthy, um, the main source of wealth in their lives is their, their home. Uh, if, they, if they're homeowners, that's the, the, the most valuable thing that they uh, have. And so, lo and behold, um, in looking at the racial wealth gap in the United States today, um, the authors found that the distribution of wealth was, was highly skewed towards white people, and that the main determining variable in that racial wealth gap was home ownership. Um, so they controlled for all of these other variables to try to see like, does this explain the racial wealth gap? Does this explain it? So they found that like attending college does not uh, uh, you know, close the racial wealth gap. Um, raising children in a two parent household does not close the racial wealth gap. Uh, working full time does not close the racial wealth gap. Spending less does not close the racial wealth gap. All of these were variables that did not explain um, why we have this continuing and persistent um, gap uh, that we'll look at statistically in a minute um, about you know the uh, rates of um, wealth and how they're connected to home ownership. So how did we get this sort of discrepancy, this this inequality, this difference with regard to to home ownership? Um, here we have to kind of trace the story back uh, many decades, um, but especially to around the years around World War II um, and, and slightly after World War II, when the suburbanization of America accelerated. And the, the, the federal government 
uh, through its housing policy and the real estate industry uh, kind of came together, uh, government and uh, real estate interests, private real estate interests came together to push this phenomenon of uh, suburbanization, um, especially in the years after World War II. And the process took on this kind of like racial dimension in a way that it came to be known as a process of white flight, of like white uh, people, of uh, um, you know, people descendant of European immigrants and European ethnic groups, basically leaving the city, leaving the old urban neighborhoods and going to these new fangled suburbs uh, on the outskirts of the city. And this was a trend that it didn't start after World War II, but it like accelerated certainly um, after World War II and into the 1950s. The 1950s are kind of seen as like the golden age of the, of the suburbs. Um, what had happened, you know, the different factors, as I said, there's both like government factors here at work in terms of the government's housing policy and uh, private real estate um, interests working as well. Uh, on the government side, the, the Federal Housing Authority, the so-called the FHA, um, had provided, was providing low interest loans for home buyers in new suburbs. And it turned out that these, you know, homeowner, uh, the, these low interest loans, these federally subsidized loans um, were, you know, disproportionately, if not almost exclusively towards uh, white homeowners. So uh, at the same time, um, FHA loans were being systematically denied to urban neighborhoods that had more mixed race populations. So in other words, like the, 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 the government, the, the federal government is making this kind of like conscious decision to funnel loans uh, towards these newly developing suburbs and to kind of disinvest out of more urban neighborhoods. And so this is a big part of how the suburbs are going to, you know, start to grow in this kind of way is, is that it's all kind of underwritten and subsidized uh, by government policy. And this um, discriminatory practice, on the other hand, of denying uh, and disinvesting uh, in urban neighborhoods came to be known as redlining. Um, and redlining is defined here as the withholding of services from neighborhoods classified as hazardous to investment because they have significant numbers of racial minorities and low income residents. It basically, it took its name redlining because like the government agents would like take out a map and look at the demographic composition of the various neighborhoods and any neighborhood that seemed like it was hazardous to investment, they would draw a red line through it. Um, and they had all kinds of ways of kind of like color coding maps of various, you know, like the urban uh, neighborhoods and, you know, kind of color coding them according to like the, the, the racial demographics um, of the neighborhood. So there was, you know, really a kind of like conscious decision at the level of government policy to kind of like funnel money out of the cities and towards the suburbs. And that prompted this kind of mass migration um, that came to be known as white flight. So along with not just the FHA money, the loan money, but also um, federal and state tax money were also being funneled towards the suburbs uh, for the construction of, of water supplies and, and, and uh, sewage facilities, and very importantly, uh, also highway construction. So you have to have those highways that are going to allow people to commute from their suburb into the cities. All of these 
um, the federal government and state governments, you know, consciously played a role in, you know, kind of, you know, investing in uh, these new suburbs and disinvesting from the cities. This was kind of also the, the, the sort of the whiteness of the suburbs it was also, you know, like kind of enforced um, by both uh, discriminatory policies and then like violent, you know, the, the sort of the threat or the reality of violence uh, and violent practices. So, you know, at, at, in terms of like the more discriminatory policies, we see the real estate uh, industry you know, routinely practicing what was known as steering in the sense of, you know, like, like a, like a non-white home buyer comes to, you know, check out their local real estate market and the real estate agent steers them towards a, like away from uh, like white suburbs and towards more, you know, kind of like mixed race or, you know, other, uh, quote, less desirable neighborhoods. That was a, a sort of a, a practice that, you know, probably doesn't go on as much as it used to, but probably still goes on. Um, white homeowners also would sign what were known as restrictive covenants in which they would basically promise that they, if they were gonna sell their property or sell their home, that they wouldn't do it to quote, undesirable uh, racial or ethnic groups. Um, you know, so sometimes this would include Jews or, you know, anybody that would be considered to be, you know, undesirable. Uh, certainly like, you know, black people, Mexican people, you know, were uh, at the forefront, uh, Chinese people uh, were at the forefront of who was, you know, considered to be an undesirable group. And then all those things failing, there's also this kind of undercurrent of violence and intimidation, you know, and everything from like uh you know acts of like mob violence to cross burnings um all kinds of things that you know if like a non-white person moved into the neighborhood there would be the use of uh force and intimidation and the, the threat of violence or actual acts of violence that would be used to drive them out of white neighborhoods so all of these factors, you know, and all of these, these, these practices and policies are all adding up to the same thing, which is to create this kind of residential segregation. Um, and, you know, not just like in the South, but like across the entire uh, United States. So um, while on the one hand, there's this subsidizing of the construction of the white suburbs. Um, at the same time, federal policy and, and redlining are also fueling this disinvestment from urban neighborhoods. And so this is why, you know, to this day in a lot of urban neighborhoods, you see what we call like food deserts, you know, in which there aren't supermarkets and there aren't like opportunities for people to get like fresh fruit and vegetables and that sort of thing or there's a lack of hospitals or health care you know all of this um these these practices kind of fuel this this disinvestment make it harder for you know businesses to get loans um or for things to get you know built in these urban uh, environments, again, this is this is this is the direct result of of government policy. Um, it didn't have to be this way. Uh, so the um, at the same time, you also have these policies that are euphemistically called urban renewal, um, but were really 
unofficially known as slum clearance in which entire inner city neighborhoods would be destroyed and residents would be displaced and moved uh, into federal housing projects. The government would basically identify certain neighborhoods as slums or as you know uh, neighborhoods where there had to be you know this this large scale uh, demolition of uh, buildings, in, including you know people's homes. Um, and this happened on a mass scale in many, many cities, um, including in San Francisco in what's known as the the, the Western Edition and, and the Fillmore District. So th at the same time that like the suburbs are booming and prosperous and like, you know, everybody's out like barbecuing and you know driving a huge car and getting in their swimming pool and you know living the american dream um the cities are you know seeing this process of of, of disinvestment um and they begin sort of popping off in in revolt during the 1960s uh roughly between you know 1964 and 1972 there are these eruptions of revolt, revolt and rebellion and riot uh, throughout, you know, in, in cities across the entire country. Um, and it's typically in response, uh, much like it is today, um, it's typically in response to, to some form of police brutality, of, of police shooting somebody or police, you know, uh, beating somebody in full view of, of others. Um, but some, you know, perception of a uh, act of police violence um, that becomes uh, sort of the the you know uh, the the, the trait. What am I trying to say? Like the you know the thing that triggers the the eruption of the violence uh, and the you know rebellion and and. Uh, all the th sorts of things that, you know, we saw, you know, also in the last few years. So these policies and, and uh, practices um, created this kind of like this segregated dichotomy. Um, the, the band uh, Parliament, the seven, 1970s funk band led by George Clinton, uh, had this song called Chocolate City that they you know, saying about Washington, D.C., um, but they had this lyric where they talked about like chocolate ci chocolate cities and vanilla suburbs um, as a way of uh, very uh, colorfully, I suppose, um, you know, trying to understand this form of like residential racial segregation that took hold, um, you know, across the entire country. Uh, shout out here to my friend Eric Avila uh, if in the um, accompanying um, uh, image that I've used here. My my friend Eric Avila from UCLA doing this talk in which he used this term, chocolate cities and vanilla suburbs. Uh, and then more recently, um, you know, after all these decades in which there was this disinvestment from the city and and like property became really devalued and, you know, things were kind of allowed to 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 go into neglect and and decline um, in more recent decades. We've seen this process of, known as gentrification. I'm sure a term that all of us in the Bay Area are well familiar with. Um, but a process of gentrification, which has reshaped urban neighborhoods with an influx of business investment and more affluent people. And so the corresponding rise of property values um, and in people's lives, this means the price of housing and the cost of rent has resulted in the displacement of lower income residents in urban, urban neighborhoods. So, you know, with gentrification, gentrification really kind of like 
um, takes hold in New York and uh, other cities, like in the 1970s and 80s, um, you start to see an influx of people, uh, you know, m more sort of uh, affluent, high, more highly educated, more uh, like professional jobs. Um, those kind of sorts of people start to move into, you know, like neighborhoods in New York, for example, that had been, you know, in long term decline and decay uh, after World War II. And so they could move in, you know, to a big loft or a big space where the rent was uh, lower or they could buy a house and, or buy, you know, some sort of building and uh, renovate it, fix it up. And uh, at the same time, also businesses are starting to move in, you know, back into the city centers to take advantage of low property values, you know, property values that had been um, like devalued. And so this, again, changes the whole, you know, and is still changing to this day. Uh, the dynamics and the, the demographics of the cities. And um, if anything, gentrification has further widened the racial wealth gap. Um, it has certainly not closed it. So San Francisco is, you know, another sort of glaring example of this. Um, San Francisco used to have a pretty substantial black population um in 19 as late as 1970 san francisco was 13 percent black uh and the, the fillmore district used to be known as the harlem of the west um because of like there you know like there was a vibrant jazz music scene and there was a vibrant black arts scene in in the fillmore and it was a real you know kind of like cultural center for um black culture on the west coast uh, uh today that is almost entirely gone uh only about five percent of the city's population today is black and um the fillmore district is you know has almost no traces of how it used to be the harlem of the west um you see this in other parts of San Francisco, uh, you know, certainly like the Mission District, uh, which is, you know, historically been the home for Mexican and Central American immigrants uh, and children of immigrants. Um, that neighborhood is certainly undergoing a lot of change because of gentrification and people being displaced. Um, I think this is a sign that, you know, kind of uh, on the, uh, the in the picture that I've used, the sign that this person is holding, um, you know, really says it all as far as like the 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 displacement that has gone along with gentrification. Um, gentrification hasn't just meant that urban neighborhoods are you know more quote nice or you know they have like better cafe or you know like um, higher end restaurants and all that kind of thing um, it has resulted in the displacement of you know thousands and thousands and thousands of people who've been you know kicked out because their rent was jacked up or you know the landlord found some other way to displace them and so along with all of that the gentrification you know, has meant displacement, but has also reshaped the cultural character that once defined these urban neighborhoods. Um, the Fillmore District in San Francisco being just one of many examples um, that I, you know, just uh, referenced a minute ago. So when we look at this, we see that the racial divide in the racial wealth divide in the United States is is persistent, um, and if anything, has just continued to grow uh, over the last few decades, um, according to this survey of consumer finances data. 
the median black family has about $24,000 in wealth. And that is only about 12% of the, uh, what the average white family owns, which is uh, closer to 200,000. And again, a, so much of that has to do with um, home ownership. And so we're talking about like the legacy of these, you know, World War II era policies that created vanilla suburbs and chocolate cities. And that the sort of the legacy of those policies is still with us, you know, is, is still, uh, re you know, reverberating into the present. Um, and that's because wealth is this, you know, such this like important intergenerational transfer, you know, it's something that's kind of handed down from one generation to the next um, and, you know, allows people to, you know, go to college and, you know, gives them all kinds of, you know, equity. Um, and if you don't have that, uh, you're at a serious disadvantage. And so it's like the, the policies of, you know, the, the World War II era have had this kind of cumulative effect um, in terms of home ownership and the, the racial wealth gap. You know, so likewise with the, the, the typical Latino family that owns only about, on average, uh, $36,000 um, worth of wealth, which is just about less than 20% only you know 19.1 percent of the wealth of the white median of the median white family and um not surprisingly as i've you know kind of intimated um this is strongly related to the divide in home ownership um which is heavily skewed towards white families um so that you know, like 72% of white families own their home compared to 40 44% of black families. Um, Latino uh, home ownership, it has increased um, between the 1980s and 2016, but still remains far below uh, the level of white home ownership so again, this is this is a this is a really important, you know, um, part of of like kind of the intergenerational transfer of wealth. How some families are able to basically pass down their wealth um, to their children, and others are not. So um, that you know kind of concludes our our look at how race and class um, intersect here. And now we're gonna sort of turn the focus towards looking at uh, class and gender. And then as we move towards the end of the lecture, we'll con consider how uh, race, class, and gender are all um, interconnected. So uh, the, the theoretical text that we're gonna draw from is Judith Lorber's uh, writing on the social construction of gender, which is reprinted in your text, the social inequality of uh, the, the uh, social construction of inequality and difference. And here, uh, Lorber is describing the processes through which social differences are created between men and women and how these expectations are enforced during interactions. So like Omi and Wenant's theory of racial formations, Lorber's notion of gender, of how gender is socially constructed, seeks to show how micro and macro levels of social interaction are connected. So again, this, this emphasis on the, you know, you have to understand both the micro and the macro at the same time and understand how they may be different levels, but they're still fundamentally related to one another and, and connected with one another. You can't understand the micro without the macro and you can't understand the macro without the micro. 
So Lorber examines gender as a kind of social construction rather than a biological fact. Although gender is socially constructed, it often seems natural or commonsensical, something that can be taken for granted and performed unconsciously. So here again is the similarity with Omi and Wanant's concept of racial formations, uh, that it's some that that race and gender are both things that are socially constructed and yet they seem natural. They are things that we perform without having to really think about it. Um, it's very unconscious. Um, it's like second nature. Uh, we are so socialized so deep into how to perform the role that is you know, assigned to our gender or assigned to our race. As Lorber puts it, uh, talking about gender for most people is the equivalent of a fish talking about water, you know, in, in the sense of like that, you know, a fish is, is always in water. Uh, it doesn't have to think about it. It takes it for granted. You know, it's just, it's part of, it's all it's ever known. And we are kind of like that with regard to uh, gender socialization. Um, the way in which it becomes um, the, the the word that Pierre Bourdieu used was habitus. Uh, it becomes like a habit. It becomes like a way of talking, walking, posture, you know, all kinds of things, you know, even at the level of our body. So that, you know, it's socially constructed, but it doesn't seem that way. It, it seems natural. You know, it seems like something that we were just kind of like born into. So our assumptions about gender are so ingrained that we tend to think only about gender explicitly when a person's gender is unclear. Transgender people, for example, may challenge our assumptions about gender. Lorber writes that gender is such a familiar part of daily life that it usually takes a deliberate disruption of our expectations of how men and uh, of how women and men are supposed to act to pay attention to how it is produced. So this is like when we take the fish out of water, <laughs> you know, like when when we show when we sort of disrupt the taken for granted expectations, that's when like the curtain is pulled back. And it's shown to be how gender is actually a social construction and not natural or biological, how it is something that is uh, performed, um, that uh, gender is something that we do rather than something that we are, um, that it's a like almost like a scripted performance, like a, a role that we play uh, in the same way that an actor might play uh, on stage. Um, I highly recommend this film called The Birdcage, if you haven't seen it, um, for thinking about these various things. It's a very humorous depiction of uh, masculinity as a kind of performance, uh, a, a sort of a thing that men, that men do rather than that men are. Uh, you know, a way of like talking, posture, walking, eating, and so forth. The, the, the kind of the premise of the movie is is that uh, Robin Williams and and Nathan Lane, who are you know pictured sitting here on a park bench, are like a gay couple, and um, Robin Williams has like a young adult son um, who has just gone off to college, and he uh, has a new girlfriend. And uh, the girlfriend's parents are really conservative. Um, in fact, like her dad is like a right wing politician. Um, and so they, uh, the, the gay couple invites the conservative couple over for dinner. And, um, you know, Robin Williams uh, is who he is, but then Nathan Lane, um, who's also seated, seated here, 
is uh, like a, a drag performer, like who performs in drag as a as a woman in the nightclubs in Miami. And so uh, Nathan Lane has a, a very kind of like effeminate habitus. Um, and so Robin Williams is trying to teach Nathan Lane how to like perform masculinity. And there's this whole very funny sequence in which he shows him like, no, you have to eat, you know, with your fork like this and you have to talk, you know, like this and you have to, you know, walk like John Wayne in the movies and like, you know, this whole kind of thing about how, and, and Nathan Lane just can't do it. <laughs> he just can't, you know, he, he can't master this, this, this kind of posture, this, this habitus of masculinity um, he, he's not able to, to do it. So in, in the end, he decides to hell with it. I'm just going to play, you know, like a, a drag performer. I'm just going to play like a woman. Uh, and he does such a convincing performance um, in playing all the, you know, sort of tropes of femininity that he totally like fools the, 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 uh, the conservative um, couple that they've invited over for dinner. Um, so it's a real, you know, if, if you haven't seen it already, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very humorous depiction of that illustrates this, this way in which gender, um, may seem natural or biological, but is in fact something that, you know, we, we, we perform. So going back to, to Lorber, um, she explains that, you know, again, like this is the, the sort of the connection of the micro and the macro. Oh, sorry. Oops. Um, she explains that gender is uh, not, you know, just this um, social institution, uh, not just an individual identity, but also a social institution that organizes our lives. Uh, she identifies gender as a process, stratification, and structure. Stratification explains uh, gender as a system of hierarchy. So women, for example, are held in lower esteem than men in many societies. So this is you know, what we talk about as a system of stratification. Gendering as a process uh, begins with the assignment of a baby's sex at birth. Uh, it continues to pattern our behaviors and expectations across the life course. Gender as a process creates social differences through social interactions that define woman and man. So again, it's, it's almost like um, these behaviors and these expectations, um, you can imagine almost like a, like a script, you know, the, in which like we are all actors and we're given a script about this is how you perform masculinity or femininity and these are the props you have to use and this is like you know the the, the role that you have to play um and we're all you know kind of we all kind of inherit those you know from the time you know that we're from the time we're born um gender as a structure denotes how uh, uh gender shapes the division of labor uh, how it legitimates authority, how it organizes sexuality and emotional life. Within this structure, devalued genders have less power and value than valued genders. This especially is true of like work. Um, women's work in many countries, for example, pays less than men's work. Um, as we'll see here in a minute, when we look at occupational sex uh segregation like basically how certain kinds of jobs are defined as men's work or women's work um but they're not only different they're not only segregated men's work tends to be more highly compensated um and held in higher regard than the kind of jobs that are considered to be women's work Um, a complementary essay to this, to um, to Lorber's work on the 
uh, social construction of gender is the article, uh, and this is again also in the social construction of inequality and difference, uh, the article by Cheryl Case called Square Pegs, A Fronting Reason. And here her essay, her essay documents her experiences as an intersex person in the United States. And she describes being intersex in the United States as quote, humanly possible, but socially unthinkable, which I think is a really interesting way to kind of put it. Like here is a case where somebody is biologically intersexed, but it's socially unthinkable in the sense that like socially, you know, we kind of categorize people as like one or the other, <laughs> you know, like basically like our, our social categories are such that there's not um, a space for ambiguity, uh, for, you know, amb ambivalence. You're, you know, either in one camp or the other camp. So born in the 1950s, Chase did not realize that she was born intersex until she was uh, 21 years old. Her parents basically hid from her the fact that she had been born with ambiguous genitalia that had then been surgically altered. Um, Chase is critical of the American medical practice of assigning discrete sex categories of male and female to babies born with ambiguous genitalia and um, forcing this assignment through reconstructive surgery and hormonal therapy, so-called therapy, rather than recognizing that biological sex is not always a dichotomous category. It's not always a case of it's either one or the other. So in other words, what Chase is pointing out is, is that like, just like gender, uh, sex can be a social construction. It can be something that is not naturally fixed, but something that is the product of human decision-making uh, by, in her case, um, medical establishment. Okay, so how does this then intersect these, these um, uh, you know, processes of uh, the social construction of gender. How does the social construction of gender intersect with the kinds of inequalities that we've been looking at in terms of class and income and wealth and uh, job opportunities and all this sort of thing? One thing we can look to for sure is, is occupational sex segregation. As I mentioned a couple of slides ago, mm -hmm. occupational segregation based on gender occurs because more because of assumptions about what kinds of work men and women are best suited for rather than because of an efficient allocation of innate talent, right? So that from the time that we're very young, um, you know, before we even like really realize it, we become socialized into the idea that there are certain uh, kinds of jobs that are more appropriate for boys than for girls, you know, that we get that kind of question, you know, from the time we're very young, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And there are these, you know, kind of gendered assumptions about like what's appropriate for uh, males and females. So um, not only is there this kind of segregation between, you know, so-called men's work and women's work, but the occupations with more men tend to be paid regardless of skill or education level. So if we hold like skill and education level constant, um, what the, the, the work that men do generally tends to be held in uh, higher value, uh, higher compensation than women's work. This is because if work is done predominantly, predominantly by women, then it is valued less in the labor market. As the rate of women working in a given occupation increases, the pay in that occupation declines, even when controlling for education and skills. So professions, you know, that used to be 
more dominated by men, um, like my profession, uh, you know, being college professors, you looked back at the 1950s and 60s, you know, the academia, the, you know, um, higher education was almost totally dominated by men. Um, there's very, uh, you know, the, the, the percentage of women in, in higher education was, was much, much, much lower. Um, and as more women have entered into higher education, it's not coincidental that salaries and uh, compensation have also declined. Um, that's what basically this slide is suggesting. And the trend is also highly racialized. Women of, uh, of color at all education levels are segregated into jobs with lower wages than their white female peers of similar skill levels. So here is where, again, we, we start to see a thing that we're gonna emphasize in the next few slides, which is the intersections of race, gender, and class. So, you know, you look at this, this kind of slide about the enduring divide between men and, and women at work, and, you know, one thing you, you notice in, in terms of like um, the jobs that are more uh, dominated by women is that they tend to be more in like care work or service work, you know. And so the jobs in which basically like, the, you know, your job is to take care of somebody else, um, tends to be kind of associated as like women's work. Um, and of course that's connected with kind of like the, the different forms of with, you know, the different ways that like boys and girls are socialized, you know, and that, you know, girls tend to be socialized into more sort of like nurturing kinds of roles. Um, so occupational sex segregation is related to this thing we call the gender pay gap, um, whereby, you know, throughout uh, the, the, you know, since we've recorded these kinds of statistics throughout the 20th century, uh, the average uh, woman has earned, you know, a, a fraction of what the average male uh, income has been, or the average, you know, male wage. Um, so you see here in the graph that like, you know, going back at least into the 1970s, women were earning about 60% of what men were earning. Uh, so, you know, 60 cents for every dollar that, that a man was making. And that began to increase substantially. That pay gap began to narrow considerably uh, in the 1980s and 1990s um, into, you know, by, as it shows, like into about 1997, we're looking at women making about 75 cents on the dollar. Um, so you have to understand, you have to remember too, that this is not just because um, women are making uh, higher wages, but also because men's wages are declining um, during these these decades because of like deindustrialization and and you know the the loss of manufacturing wages and you know men who had formerly been in these kind of like blue collar kinds of occupations uh, where they you know were making a higher wage. So you know with deindustrialization, men's wages begin to decline. And so that's another reason that the gender pay gap closes. It's not just that women are making a higher wage, it's also that, that men are making a declining wage. But still, there's always been this kind of pay gap. Today, um, it's about 80 cents, somewhere around 80, 81 cents. Um, and uh, if, you know, but people think that actually this might um, underestimate things because if part-time workers were included, like it says here in the second point, the gap would be even wider since women are more likely to work reduced schedules, uh, 
often in order to manage child rearing and other child giving work. So, you know, it's, it's that women are making a lower wage, but also they are, you know, working uh, more like a reduced schedule because of childcare demands. So you see here in the graph that like, basically the, there was this, you know, uh, the, the pay gap really narrowed, you know, in the last decades of the 20th century, but, but since, you know, around, um, you know, the early 2000s, uh, the, the rate of uh, progress has been a lot slower. Um, now, when we think about this in terms of uh, race, class, and gender and, and their intersections, um, we can sort of visualize the, the gender pay gap across various uh, racial groups here. So, you know, women overall, as we just mentioned, make about 80 cents on the dollar for uh, what men earn. Um, but then when we compare, you know, black women, it's about 61 cents. When we compare Native American women, 58 cents. Uh, when we look at Latina women, it's 53 cents. So in every um, racial group, uh, every, you know, um, major racial group in the United States, we find this pay gap as the um, the chart shows on the left um, that like in, you know, whether it's among Asian, Black, Hispanic or Latino or white uh, people, uh, white uh, among workers, we find this persistent pay gap in all racial groups. Um, one thing I also thought was interesting to, to add to this, um, you know, it's obviously a big topic in, in uh, the news and something that's facing, you know, millions of, of college students um, is the question of debt uh, and college debt um, by race and class. And sometimes debt is, you know, and like debt forgiveness is sometimes framed as like, you know, something for the, that, that privileged people are going to benefit from. But when we look at actually who, own, you know, who has debt um, and who's most in debt, um, even here we get a kind of intersectional uh, inequality where, you know, crushing student loans continue to drag many young Americans far into the negative side of the wealth line, but the heaviest are for female students. Um, women comprise 56% of college students, but hold nearly two thirds of outstanding student loan debt. So women hold uh, overall among all races, they tend to uh, hold a disproportionate amount of the outstanding student loan debt. And according to the American Association of University Women, black women graduate with the most debt, uh, around 30,000 on average, compared to 22,000 for white women and 19,500 for white men. Again, this is directly related, related to the racial wealth gap um, and you know, ultimately to home ownership. Because it's like, well, who has the ability to pass down more wealth um, to their kids so that they don't have to take out loans versus who doesn't have that kind of intergenerational family wealth and therefore has to take out loans if they're going to go to college. Um, I think we have laid bare here, you know, a, a real kind of intersectional analysis of um, student loan debt. The trend that we call the feminization of poverty. So we're going to turn here in the next few slides from questions of wealth and, and debt um, and, and income to questions of poverty. And what we'll see here, again, um, demands a kind of intersectional analysis of what's known as the feminization of poverty, which refers to how women and children are disproportionately represented 
within the ranks of the poor. Um, and women's increasing share of poverty is related to this rising incidence of lone mother households. So basically like of um, single parent households, um, the fact that you know women make less money and that there are uh, more and more single, uh, you know, like one person, you know, caretaking for the whole family um, results in the fact that you have a disproportionate number of um, female headed households that are in poverty. And again, this is something that plays out across all racial and ethnic groups. Um, the causes of this feminization of poverty include the, the structure of the family and the household, but also employment discrimination um, and the gender pay gap that we just talked about, uh, domestic and sexual violence, and the lack of reliable childcare. Um, especially in the United States, our policies of, around childcare the pale in comparison to other industrialized uh, wealthy nations in Europe or in Canada. Uh, we just don't have the same kind of childcare policies that make it easier for women to, to work and pursue their careers and, you know, pursue uh, higher education, to pursue all the things that will make them more um, valuable in the labor market. And so it's not, Coincidental, therefore, that like um, the households where the woman is the lone provider are going to be uh, more, you know, vulnerable, uh, more in jeopardy of being in poverty. And again, this is something that plays out across all racial groups, uh, as you see here in the graph. Um, the article and that that sort of takes on like what it's like, uh, what like the feminization of poverty kind of looks like and and feels like and and is lived, uh, comes from this great book called Nickel and Dimed uh, by Barbara Ehrenreich, um, and some of it is you know excerpted in the Social Construction of Inequality and Difference in your textbook, um, and. Nickel and Dime was this book that came out in, in 2001 that offered a, a firsthand account of low wage service work and low income life in, in America. Um, the author, Barbara Ehrenreich, utilized what we in sociology call ethnographic methods, meaning that she went out and like see, you know, went to see how it's lived. So she went underground, so-called underground, to learn how millions of hardworking people struggle to live on poverty wages with minimal government assistance. She sort of, you know, left her regular job as a, as a journalist. And, you know, even though she has like a, a PhD, she took all these kind of low wage jobs and tried to see if, if how, what it was like to try to live on, you know, these, these, these poverty wages where, you know, God, there is no or very minimal amounts of government assistance. Um, she did this for approximately two years between 1998 and 2000. Um, she was a woman in her, at that time, in her late 50s. So she left her home and uh, took the cheapest lodgings she could find and accepted whatever jobs she was offered. And so as the book details, she moved from Florida to Maine to Minnesota. Uh, she worked as a waitress, as a hotel maid, as a cleaning woman, as a nursing home aid, and, a, uh, and then finally as a, as a Walmart sales clerk. And the book is, is um, you know, uh, is, is really a, um, a mind, uh, an eye-opening look um, at this world that almost never gets reported about or talked about in the media. 
Um, she investigates all kinds of these difficulties that low wage workers face, you know, how in, in some ways it's like more expensive to be poor when it comes to like the hidden costs and uh, like, you know, finding shelter and, and getting food. And then, you know, the, the, the difficulties that go along with the, the, like the physical and mental difficulties of doing service work. All of this is, is chronicled in the text in ways that are, you know, sometimes, you know, make you really angry. Sometimes they make you laugh. Um, she talks about, you know, ridiculous, like, you know, drug testing and, you know, all kinds of other like humiliations that like management imposes on workers, all the ways in which like they kind of exercise surveillance and, and control uh, over their workers. Um, it's a, it's definitely like uh, a book I strongly recommend if you want this kind of ethnographic perspective onto, you know, the, the lives that millions of Americans work, uh, 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 the millions of Americans live as like the, the working poor, um, as people who are poor, not because they don't have a job, but because they have a job that pays poverty wages. So uh, we look at levels of uh, poverty when uh, from the kind of intersectional approach, we see that, you know, again, as we've seen with other um, statistics, that there is this kind of intersectional inequality when we uh, look across racial groups. Um, so for, you know, as the, the blue line in here in the graph uh, indicates that like white men uh, have a poverty rate of like 6%. Um, and then we compare with like white women and women of various racial uh, groups across the United States. And so like for black and indigenous women, the rate of poverty is like three times as high as it is for white men. Uh, for uh, Latinx people, for Latinx women, it's like two and a half times. So, um, you know, not surprisingly, given the other statistics that we've looked at, there is this kind of intersectional inequality when it comes to the questions of poverty. Um, and I also wanted to um, include here an intersectional approach to looking at uh, inequalities among transgender Americans, um, that transgender Americans experience poverty at double the rate of the general population and transgender people of color experience even higher rates. So as it, you know, the red line indicates here, a US average of 12% uh, overall, but we see that, you know, across all the racial groups, um, the poverty rate for transgender people is much, much higher. And, um, Similarly, uh, with regard to levels of unemployment, you know, so that in 2015, the overall unemployment rate for transgender Americans was somewhere around three times as high as what it was for the general population. And then um, among various racial and ethnic groups, uh, it's, you know, much higher than that. In many cases, 20%. Uh, or even higher than than that. So these, um, I think, are kind of fundamentals of a um, intersectional analysis that we're going to be continuing on in future classes. Um, in next week, we'll be looking at immigration and uh, the connection between immigration and labor and state policy and and we'll be taking a, a special look at like farm workers and farm workers movements um, in connection with the, the film uh, Food Chains. So we'll be continuing this, this kind of intersectional analysis and, and broadening it out actually um, by looking at questions of uh, like immigration status. Um, so that'll be for the next time. And uh, until then, I will see you next time. <laughs> okay. Bye.